Hello, bearded bee people. Welcome back to Bean K Bees for part four, I think. <laughs> part four of our beekeeping crash course. This is actually part four of the biology portion of the crash course, and this is on swarm science. As it says here at the beginning of this uh, section, there will be more on swarms and swarm preparation and, and swarm split, swarm prevention splits and all that kind of stuff in part two. Uh, in section two, uh, which is going to be uh, beekeeping, hive management, and how to be a good beekeeper. But for now, in the biology portion, we'll talk a little bit about swarm mechanics. So there are three types of swarms. Uh, I guess there's, there's one real type of swarm, and then there's uh, a, a couple of other issues, a couple problems that can cause something that sort of looks like a swarm. So the three types are a reproductive swarm, a crowded swarm, and an abscond. Absconding is usually due to disease or high mite load, and it normally happens in the fall uh, when that population phase shift really hits and that mite to bee ratio is really high. So be wary of uh, August and September swarms. They might look giant, and they might you might think, wow, you know, this is a crazy cool colony to be producing this many bees and sending out swarms this late in the year. Uh, that is a wrong assumption usually. Normally it's a situation that was untenable back home where the bees decided, no, we've got to try to figure something else out because we're not going to survive here. And usually that's a cause or that is a result of a high mite load. Crowded swarms happen when the brood nest becomes backfilled with nectar during uh, the nectar flow portion of the year. This can be avoided by providing empty cells for the queen to lay in and by adding space for honey stores right up above the brood area. <clears throat> so uh, as the nectar starts to come in in June and July, um, if we aren't continually adding empty space around the brood nest and making sure that the brood nest itself contains empty space, uh, then that nectar is going to go into the brood nest, and as soon as that happens, those bees are going to start swarm preparations. Uh, these are all avoidable. You really don't even have to get into the brood nest, per se. You just really have to make sure that above the brood nest is empty. If that is the case, those bees will work their butts off to keep that brood nest free of nectar, and you should be good. So this is how we run singles throughout the honey flow portion of the year. Um, you'd think that with all that nectar coming in and that tiny, tiny little brood area that they would get crowded all the time, but that's not the case. The bees are very good at moving the nectar around and keeping it out of the brood area. So, reproductive swarms are the fruit of the colony's yearly labor. As successful colonies build up in the spring, they are waiting for a few cues to start swarming preparations. So as I've said in previous videos, that is the main goal of a colony of honeybees is to send out a large reproductive swarm at the proper time of year that gives the parent hive enough time to uh, recover and uh, you know produce enough bees to go into winter itself with a good chance. So uh, the things that kind of trigger that swarm or the swarm preparations to start are an overabundance of nurse bees compared to the brood nest size. Uh, you know, and that happens when the first inflation of population happens in spring when that nectar and pollen is starting to come in. Tons and tons of eggs will be laid. And as soon as all of those nurse bees hatch, um, if the brood nest hasn't also expanded to that uh, size, which it usually has if the beekeeper is going to be managing the hive, they'll add another box or whatever. But if that doesn't happen the uh, more nurse bees than is necessary to, keep care, to take care of the brood is a signal for those bees that the situations are correct to start swarm preparation. Uh, another thing that can contribute to that is the decreased QMP or queen mandibular pheromone from either an old queen or more bees per queen. So an older queen will have less uh, queen mandibular pheromone giving off because that's a, a finite resource. And also, as you have more and more and more and more bees, there's less QMP, less pheromone per bee. So it's like having one vase of flowers in uh, a room just like this. I might smell it quite a lot, but if I add it in a room 
like a stadium with 30,000 people, uh, you're probably not going to smell, you'll smell a lot of those people as opposed to those flowers because per person, the flower scent isn't very great. So that happens with the queen mandibular pheromone as well. And uh, it's uh, one of the indications for those bees to start swarm preparations. Uh, another indication or another cue is the increased nectar flow and pollen availability. So what that, can, what that signals to those bees is that the time of year is correct. Uh, because that is very important. They don't want to be sending out swarms when winter is right around the corner. And they also don't want to set, be sending out swarms when winter hasn't finished. So the influx of pollen and nectar that comes with spring and early summer is a good cue for them to start preparations. Another is an abundance of capped brood. Uh, swarms don't tend to leave the hive without multiple sheets of capped brood. Um, it's one of, the, one of the cues that they absolutely have to see before they leave, because if they don't have that, then there likely isn't enough bees or there won't be enough bees in that hive to take care of a large brood nest for the new queen. Uh, and so they're leaving the hive in a vulnerable state. So it's one of the things that you can do to kind of ward off swarms is removing capped brood or removing brood that will soon be capped. So the first steps of the swarm are to start rearing drones and to build or clean queen cups. Uh, you can see this in a hive by the frosting of the, queen, uh, of the old queen cups with fresh white wax and the evidence of drone brood. So I don't ever recommend pulling queen cups because, first of all, this is a good indication uh, that they're starting to think about swarming when they start to put that fresh white wax on the outside of those old brown queen cups. But also because they will just create new queen cups. Um, so I, I don't ever recommend pulling those or... Uh, pulling queen cells without fully understanding what you're doing. But definitely don't just go out and rip queen cups out all of the time. You're only creating more work for those bees, and you're removing this indication that you might see in spring that they are starting to pay attention to those queen cups, and that means that swarming is around the corner. So after that, the queen is going to lay eggs into these queen cups, and at that point, the, the clock is ticking. The countdown to swarm time has begun. Um, so, usually at this point, trying to dissuade them entirely of uh, swarming is impossible. So usually at this point, you are left to splitting your hive uh, to make sure that you don't lose bees. But before that point, adding more space, you know, expanding the brood nest, making certain that there's area above the brood nest for nectar and all that. That kind of stuff can help to dissuade them. But once those queen cups are filled with eggs or larvae, uh, my advice to you is to split rather than trying to dissuade them from it. All right, so as soon as those queen cells are capped, that swarm is going to leave. Uh, so, it, you know, this is one of the reasons why pulling cells is a bad idea generally. Because if you pull queen capped queen cells out of a hive with the idea of preventing them from swarming. It's just not how it works. They're going to leave when those cells are capped. That queen might have already left, and you just took away all of their viability for a new queen by ripping those cells out. So once again, if you see capped cells, your best bet is to split if the queen and the original swarm hasn't left already, um, and even if they have left already, it's a good idea to split or uh, reduce the number of cells so that they don't continue to send out after swarms. I'll get onto that and get into that here in a second. So when weather allows, around half of the adult bees in the original queen will depart the hive in a hurry. The workers engorged with honey and the knowledge that they will most likely be starting from scratch. The swarm then collects in a ball around 10 to 30 feet in the air, usually on a nearby tree. The, swar the swarm stays together both with the use of the queen's pheromone and pheromones emitted from the worker bee's nasenoff glands. This come-hither pheromone smells remarkably like lemongrass oil and can usually be smelled coming right off a swarm or a package of bees. As the swarm waits patiently on that tree, they're going to send out scouts to go around looking for suitable locations to call home. When that home is found, the swarm is going to leave their staging area and move in usually in the same kind of chaotic 
hurried cloud of bees that they left in. Uh, so the bees want to usually move into a larger cavity than is needed to house the swarm. Uh, the optimal size on all the swarm trap plans is around 40 liters, uh, but that's usually something around uh, a couple boxes. So usually generally bigger than what we think uh, for housing a swarm because they know they're going to want to build up before the end of the year. So reproductive swarms build wax with immense speed. Uh, it's both because they know they have to build up to survive and because they came engorged with carbohydrates and honey, but also because they left with a ton of house bees, a ton of wax age bees. So my advice to you is if you do catch a reproductive swarm, don't put them in with old combs. Maybe give them a single frame of old comb so that they can start laying immediately. But other than that, give them all of your blank foundation because they will draw it out in a jiffy. Okay, so the parent hive, absent of the primary swarm, will continue to send out smaller secondary swarms until the population is too low to sustain another one. Uh, these secondary swarms are usually way smaller and they'll contain a virgin queen or multiple virgin queens. And if you don't get in there after that primary swarm, you're really risking losing a ton of bees and coming back to find just almost nothing in that hive. So once again, uh, you know, paying attention during swarm season is so important. And then even paying attention to your parent hive after they send out that uh, original reproductive swarm, that primary swarm, it's very important because they're going to continue to send out more and more and more until they don't have enough bees to do so. So here's my wife Katie with a little secondary swarm. Um, I think this was a, a little frustrating swarm that uh, I don't know if she found it or if I found it. Either way, it was straight outside of our main bee yard here at our house. And she decided to hold it up for a picture there. <clears throat> and then if this will allow me, I've got a swarm video uh, from 2019. So we were working this hive, or we were working this yard, and this started happening, and so I just set up the tripod um, and watched them leave. And you'll see at the end of this that this was a giant, giant swarm. Uh, I believe I made a video of this last year. You guys might remember uh, this scene and then also the resulting swarm. There it is. <laughs> so there's my catch box which says screen on the sides and you just gotta plop them in I swear that's about 10 pounds of bees okay so this is the end of the swarm science video we will definitely have more swarm stuff in terms of preparations that you can do as a beekeeper swarm prevention splits and all that kind of stuff in the second section of this crash course, which will be on how to be a good beekeeper, hive maintenance, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for watching. I really, really hope you guys are digging this stuff. Um, you know, it's middle of February, so there's not a whole lot of other bee stuff I could be doing. Um, and then, you know, this just is full of good information that I hope you guys are enjoying. So. Thank you very much for watching. Get out there and have some fun with your bees if you can. Uh, if not, I can't wait until I can. So uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll have an early and sunny and warm. So thank you very much for watching. Have a good rest of your day.